Welcome Linda Simpson to the stage. Says 
wonderful things about you. I was like, uh, okay, great. Who's this? This is Glenn Close. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think she must have thought I was crazy. I was like, how are you doing? She's like, oh, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> what? what? What's up? Why are you calling me? She asked me to be in this show, and I was like, yeah, that sounds like fun. Okay. Was it her idea? Yes, because she did this thing with this guy, Ted Nash who uh, does all the arrangements for uh -huh. the Jazz and Lincoln Center Orchestra, really super nice guy, several years ago, and it went really well. And they were like, well, if you come up with another idea or something you'd like to do, um, let us know. So she and Ted came up with this idea because she said um, she had wanted to do something about women in war, but she just felt like the world is so fucked up and miserable right now mm -hmm. that she wanted to do something that was about you know, that was more positive mm -hmm. and about taking ownership of your life and your narrative or whatever. So she decided to do this show called Transformation. And um, so... Is that tomorrow? Yeah, it's tomorrow. Wow. Um, now, is your career, speaking of Lincoln Center, is your career more like people approaching you or you creating stuff? Your own project? I think well, I mean, my career is about me creating stuff, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't have an agent or a manager, so if I do something really fabulous, uh -huh. it's because someone approached me. Uh -huh. because, uh, uh, I just randomly get these weird emails every now and then, and I'm like, um, okay. <laughs> that's how this happened. You know, I was just sitting in the car, and Glenn Close called me. Did you say no? I say no to most stuff. <laughs> yeah, and then I say yes. <laughs> uh, because I don't really want to do anything. <laughs> I mean, I really don't. Really? Yeah, I mean, if I, I mean, I always uh, think, you know, it's probably really lucky that I wasn't born into wealth or uh, have won the lottery, because if I did, I'm sure it's fuck wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, because I enjoy it, but I mean, I think I'm intrinsically a very lazy Tarian person <laughs> who just would love to just be in a really cushy bed and never have to move. <laughs> I mean, I probably would, but my fantasy is that I would never have to do anything. Now, one of the projects that you were involved in recently was when you went to Vienna for the um, operatic version of Virginia Woolf's Orlando, the shape-shifting Orlando. And how was that experience? It was interesting. It was, it was um, a commitment, right? It was really crazy. But I didn't agree to do that. I said no to that. <laughs> well, I said oh, I would be interested in it, but I didn't actually agree to do it for a year after that um, they asked me. Because I was like, I don't want to go to Vienna. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to leave my cats. I don't want to not do my Christmas show. Like, and all these things. So I like negotiated, I negotiated my contract for like a year before. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I did it knowing that I would probably hate it, but that I would be glad I had done it. Mm -hmm. And what was the result? I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, did you hate it just because it was so demanding? I hated it because I was in Vienna for seven weeks and I didn't know anybody. Yeah. And I get a little bit lonely and depressed when I'm not home. And I love my home, and I love my cats, and I love my friends. And also, it was in December, so I knew it was going to be sacrificing one of my favorite times of the year. I missed Thanksgiving, and I also didn't get to do my Christmas show, which is something I do every year, and I love, love, love doing. Mm -hmm. So I was like, mm, but it gave me good uh, bargaining chips. Mm -hmm. You know, because it looks good on the resume. No, because I would say, well, I'm not going to be able to do this, and I'm going to not be oh. able to do my Christmas show. So you have to give me more money than mm -hmm. I would make on that. Mm -hmm. Like I told them that I made, like whatever money I made <laughs> on my Christmas show, I usually, you know, I take it and I pay my band and I pay for my costumes. So I don't make the money that I get paid for my Christmas show, mm -hmm. but they didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> How much money I bring in, you're gonna top that and blah blah blah. So I like had good um, bargaining chips, 
and I was like, and in my Christmas show, I have a message, and I get to say what I want. When I perform, I improvise. So if you want me to be up on that stage, I have to be able to have a moment where I can say whatever the fuck I want, or I don't want to do it. Oh. And they were like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a whole section where I got to improvise. Oh, really? And say and, I mean, she wrote the part for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the woman who... The composer. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And now, um, uh, one thing that I know happened um, with the show is that the New York Times critic was not as enthralled with the show. <laughs> and um, you had a problem then with his review. I didn't have a problem with his critiques. Oh, okay. I didn't have a problem with his criticisms uh -huh. of the show. I had a problem that he was inherently misogynist. How so? Because his review uh, talked to, okay, the composer was a woman, mm -hmm. the uh, director was a woman, the lead was a woman, mm -hmm. and uh, I was a trans person, and the only people that he singled out for praise were the conductor, who's a man, and the guy who played the angel, who's a man. He said, he mentioned everybody else, but he only praised the men. And I was like, you know, this is fucked up. Mm -hmm. And this is a groundbreaking, history-making moment. And he didn't have anything good to say about Ray Kawakum from <laughs> Comme des Garçons, who did the costumes. She's a legendary person, and the costumes were beyond mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. And he didn't say anything about her. So it was just this, like... Blindly, I don't think he intentionally was misogynist, he just is. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, this like 30 year old, shockingly, um, gay man who had nothing positive to say about anyone better than the show. Well, you let your feelings be known in social media. That's my and job. <laughs> devil's advocate. Uh -huh. Do you think, though, by doing that, you're just giving him a little more uh, attention? You know what I mean? As opposed to not saying anything. And most people then wouldn't even know about the critique. No, I think he was more Oh, yeah. You mean that you did that? Yeah. Uh-huh. And I, I, I think he was more uh -huh. Because I don't think that was intentional on his part. And I think he was called out and he knew it. Yeah, yeah. Because I know people that know him. And, and also, uh, I think that he actually is a fan of mine. Mm -hmm. um, he's a Follows. I didn't know this at the time, but he followed me already on Instagram and all those things. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that he. Uh, I'm, and I also don't. I don't disagree with with his actual cri 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 criticisms of the show. So I didn't take them on because I agreed with them. What he said, you know, as a critic, was actually valid. But mm -hmm. his misogyny was loud and clear. Well, is that one of the hardest parts about being a performer? Is criticism? Not if it's valid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I, if I'd written a review, I might not have been nearly as kind as he was. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to, I'm going to go and skip around a little bit. Now, are you from your background? Is it safe to say it, it was conservative and religious when yes. you were growing up? Mm -hmm. What was the religious part? Well, um, I was raised, my church that I was raised in, I didn't really, I, I felt very loved there. Uh -huh. uh, but, I, you know, it's like the America. Was it a Protestant <laughs> church? It was a Protestant church. Uh -huh. But uh, I was raised in a very homophobic culture. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so it was difficult, obviously, like it is for a lot of people, but um, I felt loved. Like a sense of community or? Yeah, but like when, I, that for instance, when, um, when we did our Kiki and Herb show at Carnegie Hall, my mom, at my instructions, but to her credit, she did it, uh, organized a tour bus. <laughs> and 45 people from my hometown oh, wow. came, and most of them were from my church. How that people? Yeah. Wow. Including the, the girls, the, I had this group of girls that I grew up with in my church that we were all, you know, they line us up in our little baby things. Um, so they were my baby things. You know the things that you put babies in. Uh, stro <laughs> strollers. Yeah, strollers. Oh, right. oh, <laughs> the things that you carry babies in. Oh, yeah. yes. ah. <laughs> <laughs> So we'd all be there. You know, they'd be at church picnics or whatever. But anyway, from that age, we were all girls. Waste, 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 wa
<laughs> we are all in the same bucket. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so no, they we grew up from that time together, and so they, uh, it was just a wonderful thing, but yeah, those people. So it's not like, you didn't come from like a, um, like a fundamentalist, like, you yeah, know. Yeah, fundamentalist relatives. My uh, uncle Dick is a minister, my mm -hmm. uncle Larry was a minister, oh. like, and my uncle Larry was a minister in a fundamentalist church. And really? He was homophobic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I definitely sat in my aunt's house on a Sunday afternoon, I remember, and him talking about, like, San Francisco was, like, all this, you know, stuff about, uh, it was, like, Sodom by the sea <laughs> or whatever, and it was all gay people and blah, 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 and I was like, <laughs> 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 his talk about how um, gay San Francisco was was when I was like, well, oh, I better start paying attention to that town. Yeah, so it was like, I grew up with that. Mm -hmm. um, does, does religion play a part of your life now? Mm, you mean, am I religious? Yeah. In any way, though. No, but I um, feel like because of that uh, upbringing, I have a certain amount of, uh, A, authority to speak to uh, the, how fucked up <laughs> religious oppression can be. Yeah. But I also feel like I have a level of tolerance that makes me able to not just have a blanket hatred of all religious people. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. So when you got to San Francisco then, was it Sodom, obviously? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I got to San Francisco, it wasn't the 70s anymore. Yeah. That's when I heard about San Francisco. Yeah. Then. So when I got Did there, you feel like you had just, like you had missed something by the time you got there? I felt like I missed something my whole life. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> uh, yeah, because when I got there, I mean, I loved it because obviously I was in my, you know, 20s and, and it was like, Amazing, and when you're young, you have fun no matter what. Like, it's you know, it's really rare. Oh, we're seeing well, a lot of stuff that people were very, uh, you know, traumatized when I got there, and so uh, I missed a certain party. But then we created our own, like you do when you're young. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then when you came to New York, did you go through culture shock at all? Yeah. How's that? Well, I um, felt like. Well, for the first six months I was here, I was I really lay low. Oh, really? So I didn't know. I didn't want to get in, into the wrong group. Mm -hmm. um, so I sort of uh, just hung around and saw, tried to find a group of people that I felt like I could uh, vibe with and get into. And the first time I actually felt that mm -hmm. was when I went to um, Hippie Chicks. Remember when Mr. Yeah. had a party about Hippie Where Chicks at the bar? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Mistress seemed very, well, she's from the Southwest. And she's on stage was a lot more um, chill than off stage, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, it was her and Lily in the Valley and this guy. And I was like, oh, these are people I could vibe yeah. with. Yeah. I wasn't really comfortable with like the limelight and all of the that. Big club the big clubs. But, you know, there is a secret thing that people don't know, which is that I, or a lot of people, 1981, when I graduated from high school, mm -hmm. I went to Adelphi University. Oh, that's Yeah, mm -hmm. so I was here from 81 to 85. So I went to the opening night of my Oh, cool. So you were coming, coming to the city night. at that point, too? Oh, I lived in the city oh. for eight, in 1985. Oh, wow. And then I left, and I didn't come back for nine years. Oh, I see. So when I got back, everybody thought I was a lot younger than I was. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like the new girl in my um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, that really fucked Charles Bush up because he was like, I thought you were so much younger than me. I was like, Yeah, you did. Uh, <laughs> you know, that was actually one good thing too. Like, or it was beneficial maybe because a lot of people at first just knew you as Kiki, right? You know, who of course was old, right? Character. So when you started performing as yourself, all of a sudden, I young, all well, that's it. I know, and I was in my mid forties. <laughs> really seriously, well, and so, well, it was a smart move career-wise, and. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'll wait to see my next career. <laughs> No, we 
we, um, our first gig was... And, and everybody knows Kiki and her, right? I mean, does yeah. anyone need an explanation that it's... We came, I came to New York ahead of Kenny. And uh, I had this great guy, Irv Rabel, who had this club called 88s on West 10th Street. Mm -hmm. And they gave us this gig. Uh, and I called Kenny. I was like, come to New York. I got us a gig. So uh, we started doing, I think it was Thursday nights for a month at 88s in, um, I think it was probably 1995 or it was in the mid 90s. And uh, we performed there for like six weeks. And then we, uh, well, when we were in San Francisco, every <coughs> Friday night, we performed at this club called Eichelberger's, which was named after Ethel. Mm -hmm. And we took mushrooms before the show. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to New York and we started doing these shows at 88s. And after like two or three shows, all these people were coming and we were shrooming for all those shows. <laughs> and we were like, we need to up our game. <laughs> so doing these we did a show without mushrooms and then we had a big falling out and didn't perform together for nine months after that. <laughs> and then he came back because I had gotten this gig at. Cowgirl Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah. Cowgirl. Yeah. And uh -huh. Sherry and I were doing Kiki and Cher. <laughs> oh, and, yeah. uh, we were playing these two showgirls who were auditioning for all these Broadway shows <laughs> for parts that we weren't, that we thought we were right for. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we kept running into each other <laughs> at these um, auditions. Neither <laughs> <laughs> of us were getting the parts. That was the, that was the conceit for the show. And then Sherry. I and mean, it was going really well. Mm -hmm. And then Sherry started doing this thing called biography at Mother with um, Hattie Hathaway. So she was like, um, I'm going to do this other thing with Hattie, so I'm not going to do our thing anymore. And I was pissed. Mm -hmm. But they said to me, at Count Girl, well, we'll let you keep doing Thursday nights. And by then, Kenny and I had made up. So he came back, and we started doing Thursday nights at Count Girl Hall of Fame for $100. And that was the first <laughs> And that's how we got Yeah, and then that room would fill up, and there was like windows on 10th Street, and people would be standing outside the window watching us. And that's when we took off, and then we moved to Flamingo East after that. Ah. Now, of course, Kiki and her, you know, like his mansion were Carnegie Hall, and you guys even had a Broadway run. And there was a reunion not that long ago, right? right? Is there a future for Kiki and her? I hope so. Do you, I mean, have, is there anything on the, you know, not in the works? Not in the, not in the offer at the moment. Oh, okay. And, and also, like, I don't remember the exact time frame, but like, how long had you been in New York? And remember, like, when Madonna swept you away to, was it performing at her it's birthday? Her 40th party? birthday, so. Was it, was it you and Jackie? 39. Was it you and Jackie Beats? It was me and Jackie Beat. <gasps> yeah. And, and where'd you go? L.A. Well, initially. We had been booked to go and do Madonna's birthday party at uh, Gianni Versace's mansion in Miami, mm. but he was murdered. <gasps> so that that gig got messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Kicked me in the leg Whoa. with his boot heel. 
I mean, trying to be funny? No, because I was, I don't know, I don't actually know why, but I imagine it was because he was just a transphobic asshole, you know? And he kicked me, I was bleeding. Oh my God. Oh. And, um, so this is before you were going to go this to As I was walking on stage, saying my hellos and starting my first number. So my adrenaline went through the roof, and I did the set, and Madonna was sort of like heckling me, and, and uh, I, you know, which I could handle very well. <laughs> and I uh, handled Madonna just fine, but then <laughs> my um, lover at the time yeah. overheard Madonna say, I guess she was trying to bed D'Angelo that night. Oh. Uh -huh. He overheard her say, oh honey, don't let that scary drag queen get to you. And I was like, fuck you. So I don't really like her. Um, but anyway, so uh, Jackie and I both had a really hard time that night. But it was, uh, again, one of those things where it sounds great. But I also thought, lucky I wasn't a big fan of hers. Because if it had been a really crush, I really loved her, it would have been devastating. But for me, I was just like, fuck you. <laughs> Which I actually literally said, because I got off and I finished the set. And Jackie was on, and she's her, you know, um, heckling Jackie, who also can handle her very well. <laughs> but then uh, we were supposed to do this um, duet at the end, mm -hmm. and uh, her brother Christopher came back, and he's like, "Okay, so you're gonna go on?" I was like, "No, I'm not gonna go on. I'm not gonna do anything else." He said, "Please, please go on." I was like, "Your sister hates me. I'm bleeding. I don't want to go back on." He goes, "Please, please go back on." <laughs> he goes, uh, yeah, I really do. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so we were doing we were there, a the song, and he was playing it. And so when he goes, uh, dream on, dream on, dream until your dreams come true. And uh, I go, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I thought this would be a dream come true. Coming to Los Angeles, staying in the Chateau Marmont, performing for the creative genius that is Madonna, but as it turns out, I'm just playing for the material girl and her asshole friends. No. Fuck you. And I threw my mic <laughs> Some days I look, but I mean, I when I was 
doing that because I felt like I was doing a drag character like mm -hmm. drag queens do. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't everything that I was, and I didn't necessarily uh, think of myself of myself as a drag queen. Mm -hmm. but I would play different characters, and so I was never offended by it because I felt like, especially <coughs> in those days, if I would. I mean, it's different now. People have different language around things, but yeah. you know, I certainly wasn't going to be like, I'm not a drag queen. Like, I was ashamed to be thought of as a drag queen mm -hmm. because I felt like that would be a betrayal of my sisters. Mm -hmm. So I never, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I never, certainly was never offended by it, even if I didn't necessarily always think I was in drag. Yeah. Well, I mean, I certainly understand from bad and bad. I mean, in the art, drag umbrella. There were many trans girls. Yeah, and look at the drama about it now. Well, that's just it. The language has changed yeah. so much, and people are maybe sometimes overly sensitive, you know? So, um, I don't think oversensitivity, you know, which I agree, some people are oversensitive, but I also think that that's a strategy. Uh, how so? I think it's a strategy for progress, so that, you know, people might might overplay their grievances in order to get attention mm -hmm. to wake people up to what the actual issues are because otherwise no nobody would ever mm -hmm. talk about things or address things. So you mm -hmm. use these things to like wake people up, you have to shake them sometimes. Well there does seem to be in some ways I think like a backlash to the woke um, you know, movement because well, a lot of people are, is. are tired of, of they, but they say that they're tired of the shaming. But I think we've been through this before. Like, remember in the early 90s, there was so much like backlash against yeah. PC. Who's tired of the shaming, though? Well, there you go. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. I agree. Sometimes there is, of course, a ridiculous, especially on social media, like, you know what I mean? Reaction to stuff that's kind of trivial. But in some ways, you're never going to, as you were just mentioning, progress unless there is sort of like, you know, kind of a caustic reaction. Yeah, and you have to be, um, you have to just mm -hmm. do whatever you can. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're a minority, people don't want to hear about your problems. Mm -hmm. So you have to like make, make them listen, you know? Yeah. I mean, nobody wanted to hear about white privilege. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say any names, but I just went in my apartment once and I was trying to explain white privilege to them and they literally put their oh, really? ears, their fingers in their ears and were like, Shut up! I don't want to fucking talk about it! I And now, um, one other thing I want to get back to show is, now, I... Did you um, audition for Transparent, the TV show? I did, yes. A general audition? Did you audition for like a role? role show. Uh huh. Yeah, it was weird. It was like, <laughs> Alan Lee would got, call it the um, Trans Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> Jill Solomon. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Jill Solomon. 
<laughs> and they did performances there. I mean, in the mid '90s, I played there. Like they had like mm -hmm. kind of queer night performances. I played there in like a film and I tried eight and all these mm -hmm. amazing people with so much fun. Yeah, it was like art imitates life because that's how it yeah, was really John cool. did it. He wrote it based on. Yeah, yeah, that was that was really great. I mean, I you know it came to mind too because you posted a photo of it recently. I remember like how short bus was such a like innovative. And I almost didn't do that. Oh really? Well, because I was doing my MA in London at the time. Yeah. And uh, well, initially it was supposed to be me and Sammy Joe, who was my lover, and he was the DJ, and then we mm -hmm. broke up, and then he wanted my next boyfriend to be in it, I mean, he was in a show business, and then, like, by, by the time he created the thing, by the time we shoot, shot it, I, like, was on boyfriend number three, <laughs> and I was like, oh, so I was, you know, kind of single in it, but, uh, the reason I did that was because I got to be Justin Bond, mm -hmm. and I got to sing, and I had, uh, oh, they wanted you to be a character? Well, no, they wanted me to play myself, okay. but at that time, I was so... Everybody just thought of me as Kiki. Oh, so I see. That was I a see. great way yeah. to like uh, have people right. see me as myself. Go beyond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was why I did it. Uh huh. Um, now, of course, because of um, you know you're um, a politically conscious person, I do want to know. I'm sure the audience <laughs> does too. Um, are you in favor of one particular person running against Trump for <coughs> the election? No, you haven't taken a side? No. Uh-huh. All right, I mean, I say that, you know, in the primary, no matter what, I'm voting for a woman. No matter what, you're voting for a woman. Yeah. So it's down to Amy or Liz, Yeah, right? in the primary, but, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think in New York that's going to matter much. Uh-huh. So <laughs> if you're voting for a Democrat in New York, you might as well be pissing in the wind, right? Right. It's going to be a Democrat. Yeah, and I don't want to dismiss Tulsi, and um, please do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're not a fan? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, I can't decide, you know? I Whether think, you like Tulsi well, or not? I think in many ways she's a fame whore. Tulsi? Yeah. Yeah, well then maybe she'll become president. <laughs> <laughs> All right, worst case scenario. <laughs> <laughs> if, worst case scenario. If President Trump is elected again. Oh God, no. How, what collective attitude do you think that we have to take to sort of cope with this? Um, escape. Well, escapism? Yeah, like yeah. run. <laughs> well, all right, all right. Fight or flee. All right, but realistically, I mean, I'm, of course we could flee. <laughs> but, but do you think that there just has to be some sort of zen attitude that needs to be taken? Or a much more activist um, attitude that has to be taken, or well, I mean, I think we uh, sort of have taken a more active. I mean, I feel like I had in my. It might have to go into two point oh. No, if he's elected again. Yeah. I mean, I think he's going to be elected again. I'm a little nervous. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't fucking know. It's terrifying. Right. Do you think that? See, I think too that the Republicans are Trump. Specifically, they're going to throw out some like boogeyman trans issue too. Mm -hmm. But they throw it out. Mm -hmm. They just uh, today in Missouri they uh, made it illegal to yeah. give medical uh, intervention for young trans people. Oh really? Yep. All right. That's yeah. happening yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. We are the boogeyman. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh. I'm drinking white. <laughs> <laughs> We are the we're we're the primary fundraising machine. Well, that's just it. And I think they'll throw out some issue to you know Bernie, Liz, whoever it is. Like you know, what do you think of trans athletes or you know something loaded? It's a complicated subject. You know what I mean? That'll be I'm like, a terrible athlete. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your outlook on romance? Yeah, you know what I mean for yourself nowadays. You know? Um, well, I'm single. Yeah. But I mean, I'm ready to mingle. Or <laughs> I, I, I'm actually having more sex than I've ever had in my life. Really? Yeah, that's oh, crazy. Wow. <laughs> oh, and enjoy it myself. Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, well that's great. I recently became a bottom. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was in Vienna, 
<laughs> Didn't know a soul. I was in this like very stressful situation with this opera. Like it was really intense. Started hitting the apps, you know. And uh, I found this app that Sherry Vine told me about. <laughs> and it was kind of working for me in New York to a certain extent, you know. But Maybe when I got to come, Badu. B A D U? B A D O O. Oh. Sherry's like, girl, that's what you do. <laughs> you just take your pictures, you know, your pro promo shots, when <laughs> you're, you know, dressed up and you look really pretty. You create yourself a profile, and Sherry, I don't think she would mind me. She wouldn't mind me. She was like, put her thing on Sherry, or I, I think her name was, I don't know what her name was. She goes, I'll show it to you, but don't laugh. And I was like, okay. So it's like, whatever her name was, 38 was her age. She was like, uh huh. And she would just be like, you know me, I just like to suck dick. So she gets off work at midnight. She arranges to have someone meet her at her building. She sucks their dick. They go, and then she gets out of her outfit and goes to bed, happy as a clam. Oh, so I was like, okay, that sounds pretty good. So I created my own profile. But then I got to Vienna, and I was like, boom, 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 boom. They were all really interested. And I was like, okay, whatever. And I um, just was, I don't know. Anyway, I started to bottom, and I was like, why have I been working so hard? <laughs> charge. I'm so stressed out working on this opera. I run my own career. I'm my own man. I'm my own agent. I have a house and an apartment. I'm like working, working, working. When I'm getting, when I'm having sex, I don't want to have to think about anything. Let them do whatever they want. And I just don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to um, open the conversation to uh, questions, uh, but I'm going to ask uh, uh, Justin Vivian Baum one more question, and then we're going to have questions in the audience. So if anyone would like to uh, participate, please let us know. But what would you now say to your 20-year-old self? What would the advice be? My 20-year-old self? Yeah, approximately. Oh. <laughs> I guess I would just tell them to relax. Relax? relax. Yeah, yeah, me but too. But basically, I would tell them that, you know, they were, um... Lovable. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That they, um... Well, I would basically tell my 20-year-old self to relax because everything you hope that's going to happen will happen. Oh. Very nice. And uh, don't be so mean to yourself. Yeah. Have no sex. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my 20 year old self, I would say, have more protection. So. Who sex? Oh, which I still do. Good. Yeah. Good for you. I, I might be a bottom, but I prefer uncommonness to pills. Uh -huh. Good name for your new book. <laughs> <laughs>
kid. And he came to see some show with Rufus, and I was like, oh my god, he's so sweet and gorgeous. And uh, he was doing his degree in fashion at the time. And he was a key in her band. And uh, so he, and I was doing solo work there in London. And uh, he start, started to make me things for my shows. And then um, when it came time for his degree show, for his first collection, the name of his collection was The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, which we used to do that mm -hmm. song as Kiki and her. And so he asked me if I would perform <coughs> at his um, first show, oh, cool. which I did. His first Broadway show? Yeah, his first, oh. yeah which was for his, his degree in college. And then, uh, you know, I moved back to New York and I didn't hear from him for a long time. But in the meantime, he became like a big star. And so, uh, like two, not this past September, but the September before, I had gone to the fashion gala at this is a long, the long answer. Um, I'd gone to the fashion gala at the New York City Ballet where I ran into um, Giles Deacon, who's dating Gwendolyn Christie, and I met her that night. And I loved him. And I had all this time thought that Giles was a fag. And so I was like, oh, this beautiful, gorgeous Amazonian woman is having this relationship with this gorgeous gay guy. And they're like so into it. And then I was thinking about, um, Michelle Lamy and uh, oh, Rick Owens, and I was like, I need to have, I need to marry a gay fashion designer. <laughs> <laughs> Who should it be? Jonathan Anderson. So I immediately um, messaged him on Instagram because I was just feeling stupid. And I, did, and I was like, oh, are you going to be in New York anytime soon? No, I just left New York. I'm in San Francisco. Oh my God, I'm going to be there on Tuesday. Let's have drinks. So I went to San Francisco. I mean, I manifested all of this in <laughs> like four days. And I went to San Francisco. We met for drinks. He had his gorgeous boyfriend there. And uh, we had a great time. And he was like, we should collaborate. And I said, yes, that would be so much fun. And then we started thinking about what to do. And he came up with this idea for this home shopping network thing. And he asked me to do it. And he said, you know, who would you like to do it with? And I asked Joe Pangala. And we made them, and then it just was so much fun. <laughs> so that happened last year, and then we did the, um, the new ones for Christmas. <coughs> so um, I don't think I'm going to probably marry him, but it worked out really great. Uh, you're like a spokesperson. I'm a model. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. 
good for both of us. I mean, let's go in. Go ahead. Well, you know, I'm always saying shit about what everybody should do. Everybody's got an opinion on the internet. And right. Like, blah, blah, blah. I was like, you know what? In this particular case, I don't have a show that day. I need to, like, put my money where my mouth yeah, is. Yeah, I so. It's easy to just, like, write what you hard, think, just even say it on stage, but, you know, you have to sometimes, when you can, go out and I just thought it was really important. Yeah, so, um, well, for me, I mean, yeah. I mean uh, Jane Pot has been doing that a lot lately, being arrested, and you know, in an anime, she's got, you know, she comfort. my look. <laughs> <laughs> but she was but such an inspiration for me. As a uh, child, uh, yeah. Oh my god, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because the first time I really became aware, it was, you know, I grew up in, um, I was born in 1963, so the Vietnam War, all of those protests and the women's movement, and, mm -hmm. to the, and what was it, yesterday or today, that the yeah. ERA was ratified yeah. oh, in the state of Virginia, so it's oh. like 38 states, which is however many you need to ratify. Because it's stalled. So they right. will ratify mm -hmm. the ERA. Is that the word? Ratify. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, in the House of Representatives, but of course, obviously the um, Senate refused to let that happen. But you know, at a certain point in the seventies, I really thought that the ERA was going to be ratified, and I thought then if everybody is equal, you know, I thought in my mind that no matter what gender you were, you would have um, equal rights. Mm -hmm. And I mean. <laughs> Even if it wins, we still, trans children will still be abused in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, uh, two more questions. Anybody want to? Yes, way in the Way in the back. Way in the back. Are you uh, still driving your parents' car, Fantasia? Yes, I am. Oh, well, what'd you ask? How's she doing? What'd you ask? She's great. She, for some reason, her... Uh, can I ask, what was the question? Am I still driving my um, parents' car my, when my dad died? Oh. Um, and my dad died. Um, when I uh, inherited his car, uh, uh, 2003 um, minivan, mm -hmm. and her name was Fantasia. Oh, okay. and uh, I, well, I drove everybody to the Supreme Court in Fantasia. Oh. And, um, but her um, tiger light keeps coming on, but I've gone back to Mavis, and evidently it's fine. She's good. <laughs> um, and then there was one more question I think in front of the gentleman that just spoke. But yes? Uh, do you record any of your shows? Do you have any old recordings of the Kiki and Herb with Joe's Pub? And will they ever become public? Yes, and I don't know. <laughs> hmm. Are there any old recordings from San Francisco? I mean, wait. You know, wait. like, I have, I have boxes. <laughs> Cassettes. Uh -huh. Whatever. Everything up to my... Those things you stick into your computer. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I have all of it, but you know, like you know, Melanie, who I love, who's a folk singer. She's got a son, and he listens to all that shit, and it's like, Mom, this is great. We should make this into a live album or whatever. But do you really think I'm gonna sit and listen to all those tapes of the past? Mm -hmm. Me doing things like it's the last thing I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. So I've got all that shit, but I certainly mm -hmm. have no interest in listening to it and trying to figure out how to like turn it into something and release it. Mm -hmm. I'm too selfish of a person. I just wanna, you know, enjoy my cats and eat a nice lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe if there was a documentary, somebody else could do that. You yeah. wouldn't have to yeah. do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, you're a modern gal, always looking to the future. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Jessica <laughs> Shapiro. <Schreiber. laughs> Thank you so much, too, because this is a benefit for Wild Project. And if you've never been here before, it's a fantastic space. Yes. And they always do really interesting programming. And um, it's really um, a great, I I'm glad that we can both help. Yeah, I'm obviously. So, anyways, Justin and Lincoln Center this week and Joe's Pub coming up. Thanks, Justin. Thank you.